Okay, so in today's presentation, uh, you won't need to connect to audio. As long as you can hear us, that's all that matters. Um, however, if you do wish to ask any question um, during the presentation, we encourage you to use the chat window. Now, to find this chat window, uh, please, look, please look at the right corner of the WebEx platform to find the chat tab, which is on the, on the top panel. Um, this will open a chat window. Uh, from here, all you need to do is type your question in. So you can feel free to enter your question in at any time during the webinar. Um, for those of you that are using a mobile device today, then to access the chat window, you simply click on the person to the web icon on, top, on the top panel and then the chat bubble icon on the bottom of the screen. Um, so today we're all here to learn, so we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, regardless of how stupid you think it may be. Um, and we'll be answering your questions at, at the end of each part. Okay, so there are two parts of this presentation. Uh, the first being power factor, and the second harmonic filtering. Um, today we're estimated to take about 60 minutes, give or take. Um, so I guess we might just start the, start the presentation now. So from here, I might just pass you over to Pete. We'll talk you through part one of this presentation today. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, as Gray mentioned, there's going to be two parts to the presentation today. The first part will be power factor correction, and the second part will be the harmonic filtering. So basically, I'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with power factor correction or not, um, but this slide gives a, a brief introduction to, to power factor. Essentially, it's a measurement of how effectively a, a site is using electrical power. Uh, basically, the higher the power factor, the more efficient your plant, and this obviously extends all the way back to the, to the generation. There's a bit of, uh, the paragraph at the bottom here is actually a quote from the Energex website. So Energex are the uh, suppliers, distributors of power in southeast Queensland. So this is taken from their website. And it basically says power factor is a measure of how effective incoming power is being used at a site. It's expressed as a numerical value between zero and one. The closer a power factor is to one, the more efficient the business is consuming electricity. A power factor of between 0.95 and one is more cost effective. So what this slide here shows, uh, it's got a you can see an MCC, a motor control center, with a couple of motors. Now, motors uh, being an inductive load, they consume some reactive power as well as active power. So what we're seeing here, the, the, what's shaded blue, is the active power, the kilowatts that's doing useful work. The orange that you can see in this uh, picture is the reactive power, which is basically uh, not doing any active uh, useful work, but is still required for magnetization of the, of the motors. So basically, we've got our active power, which is our working power, and we've got our reactive, which is non-working, but is still needed to create the magnetic field for inductive devices, such as motors and transformers, to, to operate correctly. The third variable is your apparent power, which is uh, referred to as KBA, apparent power. And that basically equals your active power, your kilowatts, plus your reactive power, being your kilobars. A great analogy, you probably may have well seen this uh, representation before. It's very useful when showing, uh, explaining power factor to somebody who's uh, from a non-electrical background. And it's, of course, to use the beer glass analogy. So if you think about the overall glass as your apparent power, or KBA, then inside the glass we've got the beer, which is the kilowatts, or the active power that does the, the useful work in this case. And then, of course, we've also got some kilobars, which is reactive power, or phone, which is not performing any useful work. So this is a, a great slide to, to show people the analogy of a beer glass representing KBA, kilobars, and kilowatts. So just extending the analogy slightly further, if you look at this slide and look at the top half, again it's showing, showing the beer glass, you can see about two thirds full of beer and about a third full of uh, foam. We could say this has got a poor power factor because there's not that much. The amount of beer, there's a lot, still a lot of foam in there. So to calculate the power factor, 
we would take the active power in kilowatts and divide it by the apparent power in kVA. Or using the beer glass analogy, you take your drinkable beer and divide that by the full glass of beer to get your power factor. So we can see the top glass, a lot of foam in it. You can say that one's got quite a poor power factor. However, the, the bottom glass, pretty close to our unity power factor. There's virtually no, no foam in it whatsoever. It's all useful power. Okay, so looking at it from a slightly more engineering perspective, then we've got a, a triangle here, active power in kilowatts along the x-axis. We've got reactive power in kilobars on the y. And you can see the, the triangle um, interaction, and you've got your apparent power in kVA at the top. Okay, so there's a lot of reactive power here. If we introduce now a capacitor bank, which introduces also some kilobars, but of a capacitive nature, obviously. What we see happen here, just bear with me one second. Right, what we see happen here, by introducing the capacitor bank to introduce uh, some more kilobars, we actually reduce the reactive power. And by reducing the reactive power, we reduce the KVA. So when you've got a, a site with inductive loads like motors and transformers that have a poor power factor, without any sort of power factor correction, you're pulling your reactive power from the network, from the supply authority. And co uh, consequently, your KVA demand from the supply authority is, is high. However, if you install a PFC, a power factor correction unit, capacitor bank, on your site, you can produce local reactive power instead of pulling that reactive power off the network. Therefore, you're reducing your KVA demand from your, your supply authority. And as we'll see as we go through the, uh, the presentation, all the supply authorities now are charging on a KVA-based um, demand tariff. So there's obviously many reasons to look at increasing your power factor, improving your power factor. This analogy, uh, this slide here, expands on it uh, a little bit further. If we look at the top half, we've again got a motor control centre with two motors, but without any sort of capacitor bank at all. So again, we've got a lot of reactive power shown in, in the orange. If, however, we introduce power factor correction, i.e. capacitors to produce local uh, reactive power, you can see here, we've suddenly got rid of all that reactive power in, in the MCC, we've actually now got more available active power on site. So what are some of the reasons why you should consider improving power factor? Okay, as I mentioned, in, in every state, the various uh, utility authorities are charging on a KVA-based demand tariff. So if you can add power factor on the site, reduce your reactive power that's been pulled in from the network and hence reduce your KVA, your electricity bills are going to reduce. You're going to get penalised less for your KVA demand. So there's obviously a direct financial benefit there. Another um, reason is reducing I squared R losses. So if you think about it, you're pulling lots of reactive power through your cables to your various pieces of equipment. Well, you've got more current flowing in those cables. The current is uh, creating heat. Heat's increasing resistance, which increases your, your voltage drop. So that means for a piece of equipment with a, with a voltage drop, you've got to have more amps to produce the same amount of power. So that's obviously adding to your, your kilowatts. So by reducing the uh, I squared R losses by having power factor correction, you can reduce your kilowatt hours consumed. And the third point is can de defer investment. So some of your equipment may be fully utilized, so you, your transformers, MCC, bus bars, cabling, etc. If that's fully utilised and you want to increase production, but well, you've got two choices. A, you've got to upsize all of your equipment, your cables, your MCC, and your transformers. Or an alternative approach could be to add power factor correction and therefore free up capacity, which defers investment. So the next slide basically shows graphically the third point I was talking about, about freeing up. Uh, equipment capacity. And it's showing a transformer here. And, and on the left hand side, it's, it's showing as you're increasing, improving your power factor, you're reducing your kilobars, the reactive power that you're pulling from the supply authority. And consequently, you're reducing your KVO. So in this slide here, they show from 1500 
KBA transformer by increasing the power factor, you've recovered 317 KBA of capacity. So that could be the difference between having to upgrade your transformer or not. So you can imagine the cost associated if you have to upgrade a transformer, not only the, the cost of the transformer, but the supply authority has got to do their connections on the, on the MVHV side and all the uh, disruption that would cause. So a much more cost effective way if you've got a poor power factor on your site would be to introduce power factor correction and potentially negate the need to uh, upsize equipment to free up capacity. Okay, so what do ABB have in the way of a power factor correction offering? In their LV uh, side of things, they have their, their Abacus series. And what we see on the slide here, you have their, their basic wall mounted units, which are the smaller ones. So they go up to 100 kilobars. So that can be, in a, it would basically be in a, at 100 kilobars, would be two steps of 50 kilobars. The wall mounted, as mentioned, IP31 is standard. However, there's many options for them. And an IP54, if you need a high IP rating, is an option for the wall mounted units. They have a 7% detuning reactor. The purpose of the <coughs> excuse me, the purpose of the detuning reactor is to basically block harmonic currents flowing into the capacitors on the PSC unit. Obviously, over it, if you've got lots of harmonic currents flowing into your capacitors, that will over a period of time cause the capacitors to fail prematurely. So all the AGB uh, power factor correction units have this detuning reactor fitted as standard. So after the wall mount units, where you get a, what they call an indoor freestanding unit, now there's a whole heap of sizes going up to 900 kilobars. So they could be in a single tier, which is what's shown on the left hand side, or a double tier, double door cabinet as the capacity increases or even a triple. IP31 is standard, which is why they call it an indoor uh, unit. However, there's an IP52 option, again, detuning reactor. Finally, they also have an outdoor freestanding, so this is IP54 uh, as standard, but there is an IP64 option available. Again, it's modular, so you can expand the number of tiers, the number of doors uh, to meet your requirements. ADB also have stuff in medium voltage as well but we won't be talking about that today, but just keep it in mind, in addition to this LV um, capacitor banks, we also have NV. What this slide here shows you is sort of what you would expect to see inside a, a capacitor PFC unit once the doors are off. And what you can basically see is the different trays or steps as they're, they're known. So basically each tray or step has a contactor which can be energized or de-energized depending on whether that particular tray needs to be activated. It has uh, fuses, the, the detuning reactor, the capacitors, and also discharge resistors. So that's basically what a, what a tray or a spec contains. And there's different kilobar sizes, 12.5, 25, and 50 are the standard step sizes ABB offers. So you've got lots of flexibility to make up the uh, the, uh, the cap bank for your particular application needs. So we're about to be manufactured for this, the uh, ADB uh, PFC units. The, the cabinets are manufactured locally in Australia, so ADB use a, a local Australian switchboard builder to manufacture things to a high quality that meet AS3000 standards. All the components, so the, the trays that I've spoken about, the power factor controller, everything is wired and assembled in ABB's factory in Lily Dale in Victoria, and they perform a, an FAT, a factory acceptance test. The, uh, the components, so the capacitors, uh, reactors, contactors, PFC controller, they all come from ABB factories in Europe. So they're all manufactured at ISO 9001 quality standards. So there are many uh, PFC uh, manufacturers on the market, but not all of them have this high quality. So you always have to be very careful uh, when, when looking for power factor correction to make sure you're getting high quality components. And you can be assured of that with, with ABB. So the cabinets, they also being locally made, you have some options um, for specific applications to, to customise them. So the standard, the, the, 
the door doesn't, it's locked, it's obviously lock, locked, but it doesn't have a, a door interlocked load brake switch or circuit breaker. But you can order that as an option. So in some cases you may not need it because it might only be a few metres away from the switchboard that's supplying power to it. In which case you might do the isolation of the circuit breaker at the switchboard. But in other instances, the PFC cabinet may be some distance from the, the nearest from its supply point, and therefore you require an isolator or a circuit breaker. You can up the bus bar ratings uh, when, when required or to meet specifications. You've got mod bus communications uh, capabilities. Uh, you can have like flashing beacons on the cabinet roof, siren, all of these type of things, a contact for a remote alarm that could be wired back into your control system. So these are only some of the options, there's many more, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, they are customizable. So then you have the Power Factor Controller, or the HMI, this actually mounts on the front of the cabinet door, and this is the brains of the, uh, of the PFC unit, if you like. So basically what this stuff, the PFC controller does, is it looks at the, uh, what the, the power factor is on the network, it looks at what the, the current load is, and then based on the target power factor, the user programs into it, it decides how many uh, trays it needs to, to pull in to correct the power factor. Now there's two versions, there's an RBC, which is on the left hand side picture, this is a more, uh, obviously a more basic unit. It comes on the wall mount units as standard. So basically that's a push button, monochrome, uh, HMI. Um, so it's still a, a user friendly unit, but if you want something a little bit more advanced, then we have the RVT, which is obviously on the right hand side of the, uh, the slide here. So the RVT is a, is a color one, it's got a touch screen, it shows you more variables, uh, it's got graphs. It's also got the Modbus communications capabilities that I spoke about. So when I say Modbus, I'm saying Modbus RTU, so Modbus over 485. The RBC, the more basic one, doesn't have the Modbus communications. So to repeat, on the wall mounted units, you get the RBC as standard. On the freestanding cabinets, you get the RBT. However, if your application is particularly, if your customer is particularly price sensitive, you don't need all the functionality of the RVT. You can, of course, order the, the freestanding cabinets with the RVC controller if, if you wanted to save, if you need to save money. Okay, so sales opportunities. What, where are some of the what are some of the opportunities to sell these power factor correction units? Well, we mentioned three, three reasons a customer might want to do it. It could be deferring investment, and that's a very valid reason. Obviously, helping to um, reduce your kilowatt hours by cutting your I squared R losses down. But probably the most prominent one we see is, is these KVA based tariffs. So, in Queensland, Energex, if you look up South East Queensland, introduced a KVA based tariff for users over a certain size as of the 1st of July 2015. They were going to be getting uh, billed for their, their KVA usage as well. And this has already been in operation in other states and is, is increasing more and more. So if you know a customer, so you can speak to your customer about the KBA based tariff, the easiest thing to do is to ask for a copy of their electricity bill. And you may be able to see up on the, on the slide here, if you look on the, on the right hand side, uh, part way down, you should be able to make out some uh, text saying demand critical peak. And it shows uh, dollars per KBA. Uh, per annum, and you can see a figure there of, uh, of um, I think it's $30.43 30 per, per KVA, and you've all got the, the demand capacity. So a very simple example could be if they were getting, say, charged uh, $10 per, per KVA, and they had a KVA demand of 1,000 1, KVA, obviously at $10, they would be getting charged $10,000. If they were to improve their power factor and say reduce their, their um, KVA demand from 1,000 back to 800, well we now we've got, a, we've got 800 KVA at $10, well that's $8,000. So by improving their power factor they've made a $2,000 saving by reducing their KVA from 1,000 down to, to 800. 
So who should be some of the target customers you should be looking at uh, speaking to about Power Factor? Well, if we look in two market segments, if you look at first of all commercial, then you've got many examples up here. So like supermarkets, Woolworths, Coles, Audi, all use Power Factor correction. Your shopping complexes, so like your Westfields, for example, bottle shops, Dan Murphy's, BWS, uh, hospitals, government buildings, so that's schools, councils, police stations, any of these uh, commercial buildings, if they're a large user, there's a good chance they'll be on a KBA based tariff. So again, getting a copy of their electricity bill will help you be able to work out the, the, the savings um, they can make and also calculate the return on investment of installing a power factor correction unit. We can then move over to the industrial uh, section and some of the, the examples here, by no means exhaustive, um, are mining, your water treatment plants, see a lot of power factor correction there, food processing, quarries, ports. It's basically any, any large industrial customers that have a high demand, they're, they're prime targets to speak to about power factor correction. Okay, before we move on to the active harmonic filter section of the uh, presentation, I'd just like to pause now and give you the opportunity to enter any questions in by the, the chat window. Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, as Pete said, um, now's your chance to ask any questions you may have just by simply clicking on the chat window on the top panel and then just typing your question in. Um, we do have some questions here already for you, Pete. Uh, the, first okay. one, the first one here is, can a power factor of one ever be achieved? Well, the answer is, in, in theory, yes, you could get up to a, a unity power factor, i.e. a power factor of one. Uh, in practical terms, it becomes very expensive. Um, for example, it's not like a linear relationship, say, if we're going from, uh, say, 0.95 up to, up to one, i.e. you kind of sort of added one trade, going from 0.95 to 0.96. The closer you're trying to get to unity, uh, the more trades are required. So it becomes very expensive. And the other thing to keep in mind is the power factor unit controller won't let the power factor go leading, i.e. go from being an inductive lagging load to a capacitive leading load. So what that means is to try and get up to dead on one, you would have to also have quite far, um, um, small step sizes, potentially resolution and step sizes, so you could go from 0.99 to one without pulling in a tray and actually sending the power factor leading. So yes, in theory you could, but would you want to in reality? No, because a lot, I, a lot of the supply authorities, I know Energex in South East Queensland, they talk about a power factor of 0.95 being desirable. So they're not going to penalise you if you're point, once you get to 0.95. Therefore, spending that extra money can go to 0.95 up to 1 from a penalty point of view wouldn't, be, wouldn't make any economic sense. From a capacity point of view of freeing up equipment, yes, you might want to consider improving it beyond 0.95 but I think one would probably be a little bit ambitious and unnecessary. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now, are all states now charging by this KBA method or are there differences from state to state? Okay, well, within each state there's multiple uh, utility providers. So the, the various utility providers uh, have KBA-based tariffs. What they actually charge uh, can vary from utility provider to utility provider. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have, not all utility providers in every state have KBA based uh, tariffs, but generally in each state you'll find at least some, if not all, do have a KBA based tariff. We also have more detailed information on this where we've comp uh, compiled uh, documentation for the different utility providers and we would be happy to send that out to you. So you so you can then speak to the, uh, the relevant utility providers um, as required so we can arrange for that information to be sent to you. Okay. Um, so what is uh, the process then to quote a power factor uh, solution? Yes, that's a good, very good question. The, the process, we need some key information. Generally speaking, that can be uh, found on the electricity bill, so getting electricity bill as a starting point. What we need to know, essentially what we need to know is what is their, their peak demand, so that peak demand could be expressed in KBA or it could be in kilowatts uh, or even if they take some measurements in current, but we need to know their peak load. We need to know what their uncorrected power factor is, i.e. what their current power factor is, and we need to know their target power factor, which will be 
generally determined by the utility provider where they're going to get penalised at. So if we know the target, we know what their existing uncorrected power factor is, and we know their peak load, they would be the basic information to start the process um, to start the process of going back quoting the PSC unit. Um, also, what is a typical uh, return on investment from your experience? Uh, what about what about uh, finance packages uh, to preserve the capital budget? Okay, the two two very good questions. I'll answer the return on investment one first of all. I mean, it can, can vary widely, but I've seen the examples I've been involved with where the uh, applications I've been involved with where uh, the customer's got um, you know. And a fairly poor power back. I'm not talking something extreme, but it might be down in the 0.7 region, okay? And they're a, a re, you know a, a medium to large size customer with a fairly uh, substantial peak demand. We're, we're talking around about the 12 month mark has been typically the return on investment. So you've broken even at 12 months, and then after that, everything's a saving from that point onwards. In regards to the second question about the finance package. Um, Control Logic have partnered up with a finance company to be able to offer a, a, a finance solution. So what that means is sometimes the customer, although they want to save money, they may not have the capital expenditure available, or it may be allocated for other other things. So by using the finance package, they basically pay a monthly fee um, for that. But they, so therefore, it, it can come out of a, another budget, like a maintenance budget, shall we say? But they're getting straight away. They're getting each month. They're getting savings on their electricity. So if you have a, an application where um, that's going to be of uh, interest to your customer, let us know, and we can uh, look after it. We can deal with the finance side of things as well. Okay, we have a question here. Um, if there is any harmonic issues with the flight, will the RBT controller identify this? And if so, will the RBT controller go into alarm to prevent damage to the PVC? Uh, yes, good, good question. Yes, the, uh, yes, good, good question. The, uh, the short answer is yes. The RVT controller uh, it does measure harmonics and it brings up an alarms on that. And if the harmonics exceed a certain amount, it actually switches off the cap banks to protect them. And then when the harmonic levels drop back down again, it will re-energize the cap cap. So obviously during that point, you're not getting power factor correction happening. Um, but at least it alerts you to that and protects the unit from damage. But if harmonics are, uh, you're, you're concerned about harmonics on your site, it would be better to do like a power quality study and identify the harmonic values uh, in advance of uh, putting in the PFC unit. Okay, another question here. <coughs> Excuse me. What percentage of, of harmonics is damaging to the cap strike? Is there a baseline figure and voltage harmonic? And current harmonics that we can use as a warning guide. Okay, uh, yeah, another good question. So ABB uh, mandate a total harmonic distortion voltage of eight percent. So if you've got a THDB of eight uh, percent or, or greater, then you want to be looking at trying to reduce those, reduce or mitigate those harmonics before putting in a power factor uh, correction unit. So they have a total harmonic distortion voltage of eight percent. There's also some individual harmonic limits of the 5th, 7th, 11th and 13th, but I can send you information on those specific individual ones, but for now, a total harmonic distortion of 8% should be your, your cut-off point. Okay, great. So if there are no more questions, we'll move on to part two, so which is um, active harmonic filters. Well, thank you, Grace. As, as we'll kick into part number two, the harmonic filtering. So I'd like to start talking here about poor power quality and what it means to people. So the, the, a definition of poor power quality is any event related to the electrical network that makes you lose money. I won't read out all the different dot points here, but some of these examples can be uh, power supply failure, so fuses blowing that shouldn't, that, you know, should be sufficiently rated but they're failing. Again, circuit breakers that have been sized for the, the load uh, are tripping and other things such as equipment malfunctioning or greatly reducing the lifetime, like capacitor problems we, we spoke about before. So these are, I guess, they're slightly more intangible um, costs. So with the power factor correction, it was very much a tangible cost, and that cost was the electricity uh, supplier billing you for your KVA demand. So that was a very, a very tangible, very easy to see cost, 
but with harmonics are a little bit more subtle and at intangible costs. Uh, but if you're starting getting all these problems here, the cost can be far greater than the, you know, these pe get penalised through KBA um, usage. It could be uh, production lot, um, downtime, equipment failure, so the cost can dramatically ramp up. So they're just as, as significant, if not, even, if not even more so. Just they're less hard, not quite so easy to pinpoint compared to a PFC um, KBA based tariff. So I guess there's three elements that make up poor power quality. There's harmonics, which is what we're, we're talking about now. There's reactive power, which is what we were talking about when we were talking about power factor correction. And the third uh, element is load imbalance. All of these collectively uh, cause energy to be lost and consequently uh, increase your running costs. Okay, so just a bit of basics on, on harmonics. So where do harmonics come from? So basically, uh, the harmonics are created by non-linear loads. An example of a non-linear load is a, is a variable speed drive. So when you apply a sinusoidal voltage waveform to a non-linear load, the resultant current is a distortion. It's no longer a pure sine wave. It's actually a distorted uh, version of a sine wave. And if we look at the, uh, the slide here in, in the middle, we can see a distorted waveform. So that's basically a, a, a har um, harmonic. They come from uh, created by nonlinear loads, and the resultant current is no longer a pure sine wave, even though the applied voltage is sinusoidal. So just uh, in a little bit more depth, where would we find nonlinear loads? Again, we can split it up into industrial. So your factories where you're mainly having uh, more three-wire systems. The majority is three-phase three-phase loads. Some examples of non-linear loads are the variable speed drives we've spoken about already. But you've, other, you've got other devices such as the UPSs that can generate uh, uh, harmonics. Then if we look at the commercial, so your, your office buildings, your hospitals. Here we talk about a more four-wire system. So four-wire, obviously you've got your three phases and your neutral because you've got a lot of single phase loads. So if you think about it in your office, you've got your photocopier, you know, you've got uh, fax machines, um, PCs, all that type of thing, all single phase loads. So basically these, and they all, so this creates a couple of problems. Not only the other non-linear loads, they generate harmonics, but also they can create phase imbalance. So it'd be very hard in a building to equally distribute all the single phase loads across the three phases. So inevitably, one phase will have more load on it compared to another. So you're getting phase imbalance occurring and this can cause currents to flow in your, in your neutral conductor. What this slide here does is just shows uh, harmonic distortion, and it shows if you've got varying levels of uh, current uh, harmonic distortion, how it increases the, the, uh, the voltage waveform, not only the, uh, sorry, the current waveform, not only the, the peak value, but the RMS. So we can see it on the, on the left-hand side that we've got no harmonic distortion whatsoever. We've got our peak and our RMS uh, waveform values are the same. But as the amount of distortion starts to go up, we're seeing two things happening. Obviously, there's a distortion of the sine wave. The peak value is increasing, but also the RMS, the RMS value waveform, the fundamental is increasing as well. So basically, your cable might not uh, would have been sized for a particular load. If you haven't factored in harmonics, you can see the 44% distortion. The RMS current has gone from being 100% to 110%. Now, your cabling or transformer or MCC bus bars, what have you, they may not be factored in harmonics, so it can have a, uh, a very negative effect on that, that equipment in terms of heating. So in terms of Australian standards, AS, NZS, uh, 61000 is a very commonly referenced harmonic standard, and it specifies uh, harmonic limits. So generally in industrial applications where you've got these non-linear loads like variable speed drives, UPSs that I mentioned, you will get odd harmonics. So odd, uh, odd harmonics are multiples of the fundamental. So what I mean by that is if we talk about in Australia, we have a 50 hertz supply. So our fundamental waveform is at 50 hertz. But that the, these nonlinear loads, 
uh, great odd harmonics, so they're multi integer multiples of the fundamental. So when we talk about the fifth harmonic, we're talking five times 50, i.e. 250 hertz. When we talk about the seventh, again, seven times 50 is 350 hertz. So this standard has voltage, percentage voltage limits for the fifth, the seventh, all the way through upwards. And they're all, uh, when they talk about 5% for the fifth, so that's 5% compared to the fundamental. So you have individual limits you need to meet, and you also have a total harmonic um, distortion, which is comprised of all the individual harmonics, and that has a limit of 8% there. So these are the uh, relevant standards to refer to. Okay, so we've talked about what causes harmonics, where, where would you find them, what are the, the limits we need to meet. So the next logical thing to talk about, of course, is how do we, if you've got a harmonic issue, how do we go about correcting it? Well, obviously, first of all, you have to know what the harmonics are. You may have some uh, smart metering that can determine that, or you may have to do like a power quality study to determine what the harmonics are. Once you know what they are, then you can go about sizing some equipment to fix and fix the harmonic problem. So. An active harmonic filter, which ABB sell a, a, a range of that we'll talk about later, uh, a very good way of creating uh, fixing harmonics, especially when the harmonics is not just restricted to a couple of, pe a couple of pieces of equipment, it's quite widespread. Uh, an active harmonic filter basically is connected on the network, it sits in parallel, it measures the harmonics, so you install CTs, current transformers, and you wire back into the, PS back into the harmonic filter, It'll measure what these harmonics are, and then what it does is generates uh, an equal but opposite current. So what I mean by that is, if we had, say, 5 amps at the fifth, so 5 amps of harmonic currents at 250 hertz, the active harmonic filter would also generate 5 amps at 250 hertz, but there would be 180 degrees phase shifting, so an equal and opposite amount for the harmonic currents it detects, and by doing this, it has a cancellation effect. And that's basically what the slide is showing here. You can see in the middle of the picture, we've got the load current, which is the harmonics generated by the nonlinear load. Uh, on the right-hand side, we've got the active filter current, which is generating an equal and opposite current to oppose that. And the resultant of that, from cancelling the two out, is the clean sinusoidal waveform you see on the left-hand side. This just talks about it in a little bit more detail. So, so physical signals measurements via CTs, current transformers that are wired back into the, into the active harmonic filter, which has got a controller on it, uses basically a, a microprocessor uh, on board, and basically then it's switching IGBTs in an inverter section to generate these opposing harmonic currents. And this shows schematically here, we can see the harmonic filter, as, as I mentioned, it sits in parallel, it's not a series device, it's connected in, in parallel. It has, um, it has an inverted section, which is towards the bottom, which has IGBTs that are being switched, basically, and it's generating a PWM, a pulse width modulated um, uh, waveform uh, through the IGBTs and injecting that back into the, into the network. It has a, a line, line reactor and also an output filter to, make, to smooth out that PW waveform back into a more pure sinusoidal waveform that's injected back into the network. So what does ADB have to offer in the range of harmonic filters? Well, basically they have three, three series, they have the PQFI, the PQFM, and the PQFS. And I'll talk about these in a little bit more depth. Now these are all low voltage. They have generally have two versions. They have a, a 400 volt one, which has a bit of a, a voltage tolerance either side, and they also have a 690 volt version as well. So the PQFS is there, as you can see from the picture here. It's, it's a wall-mounted unit. It's the most compact uh, uh, active harmonic filter in their range. It can do either three wire or four wire. Um, uh, harmonic mitigation. So, if you're looking at a commercial building, for example, where I, I talked about earlier, you have lots of single phase, single phase loads. 
um, because it's very hard to evenly distribute single phase loads across the three phases. Invariably, you end up with uh, phase imbalance. And then, of course, because you've got lots of non nonlinear loads, uh, UPSs, computer power supplies, all that type of thing, you're going to get harmonic currents flowing. But because you haven't got balance between the three phases, you'll get harmonics flowing into the, into the neutral. So that's why it's important that the PQFS offers the ability to not only correct harmonics in the three phases, but also to correct harmonics in the neutral, hence the, the four wire. But you've got the flexibility in it that you can just run it three wire mode if you don't need to uh, correct harmonics in the neutral, but if you do need to, you can run it in four wire mode. So basically here, it can also do reactive power compensation, and just you can connect up multiple units if you want to build in, like, if, well, A, if you want to increase capacity, um, you can do it in a single unit, you can parallel up, connect together multiple units, and you can also build in redundancy systems. So maybe you have two masters, if one fails, the other one kick, uh, takes over, so you've got full redundancy, or you could have one master, or say you could have four, uh, four filters, maybe uh, two masters and two slaves, and then if um, one slave, uh, you've got basically building capacity with one extra, so one fails, another one can take, take over. Okay, so the PQF uh, S series, just talking about it a little further, we can see basically here we've got the load balancing feature. You can connect up four units together, I was speaking about paralleling, but you can connect up four units of equal rating. IP30 is the IP rating, and you've got different current ratings depending on your need, from 30 up to, well it actually goes up to 120 amps, the slides, um, there's a further unit not shown in the slide, of 120 amps. So basically it steps from 30 up to 120 amps, so you've got a lot of flexibility to meet your application, you don't have to go over sizing it because there wasn't anything uh, available, ABB have got a good comprehensive current range there. Okay, so the next one we go up to is the PQFN series. So you would more see these, not so much in commercial buildings because they can't do uh, correct harmonics and the neutral, they're only for three wire, but they could be used, you can see these in industrial, or in industrial applications, okay, so water treatment plants, that type of, type of thing, can uh, filter up to 20 harmonics all the way up to the 50th order. They can um, create reactive power, so if they're, they're sized correctly, you could actually do a little bit of power factor correction over and above its primary purpose of harmonic uh, filtration. Again, it's full and limited redundancy, whether you have two masters or a master-slave combinations. Okay, so again here we can need, just look at the PQFM a little bit further. The standard, it comes in free standard cabinet, as you can see in the picture. It's IP21. However, if you want a higher IP rating, you can buy an IP00, which is basically comes in like a gear, uh, all the equipment that's inside that cabinet comes on a gear tray along with the controller and then you mount it inside your cabinet. So you can build the cabinet to the required IP rating and you buy the equipment as in the gear tray and uh, all the interconnections from ABB and put it in your, in your, your own cabinet. Shows cubicle dimensions, I won't go into all of this. Again, a number of current ratings from uh, 70 amps up to, up to 150 amps. I mentioned about the voltages at the start. So the standard one, which is a V1, has 208 to 480 volts. However, we also have a V2 version, which goes from 480 up to 6, 690 volts. But that's only for the 100 amp rated filter. Okay, the final one in the series, like the flagship, if you like, is the PQFI series. Again, it's a three wire uh, unit. You can do 20 harmonics up to the 50th order, reactive power and also your redundancy options. So excuse me one minute. Okay, so just a, a quick summation here about the application areas then. The PQFS uh, for typically used in four-wire commercial applications, but can be used in three-wire industrial applications where you're not getting uh, voltage notches in the, in the network which can damage the, damage the unit. Your PQFM 
is more for your medium scale industrial three wire applications. And then if you need something with that much higher power ratings, you've got the PQFI. What I did mention about the PQFI was there's two current ratings. There's a 300 amp version or a 450 amp. You've got IP21 as standard, but there's also an IP41 version of the PQFI. The only thing you've got to keep in mind with the IP41 version, the current and the filters derated by 10% because you're impeding the, to get a higher IP rating, the airflow is in, in, um, impeded more so, and that has a bit of a current derating effect. So if you're sizing up the PQFI filter, you're looking at you're looking about the IP41 version. Just keep in mind the 10% current derating. Okay, so we're at, uh, this slide just shows some of the examples where ABB PQF active filters have been used. You can obviously see at hotels, they have a very prestigious uh, project there, obviously, the Burnish El Arab Hotel in, in Dubai. But it's very widespread where ABB uh, filters are used from water treatment plants to ski lifts, uh, um, centrifuges, etc. Okay, so finally, warranty and servicing. What, what does ABB offer? We we talk about the Power Factor Correction Unit, first of all. You get one year as standard. However, this can be extended to five years by having an annual service carried, carried out by an ABB certified person. Obviously, you guys, Wilson, you've sent people of the ABB uh, harmonic filter training that was run in Lilydale last October. So you've got guys that have been certified by ABB. So you can offer to, to a client who wants a warranty longer than one year. Uh, you can get the warranty up to five years. You would obviously have to sign them up, your customer up with a service contract to come along once a year. You can service the unit. There's, there's servicing sheets in the ABB uh, Power Factor Correction Manuals that you would complete and keep those on file. So in the unlikely event there was a warranty claim, within the five-year period you've got the documentation that ABB would require for that five-year warranty. The active harmonic filter is one year. Uh, however, if you do have a particular application or project where a longer warranty is required, come and speak to us because ABB in the past have extended the warranty, but they've charged an additional amount on that to, to cover that. So that's one year standard. If, that, uh, if you do see the need for a longer warranty, please come and, come and speak to us. Okay, so I'd just like to um, throw the floor open for any questions about the chat window. Okay, guys, if you have, um, if you want to ask a question now, for the time to do it, just uh, simply type it in the chat window. We'll give you a minute um, before we move on. Well, just while you guys are having a think about any questions and uh, typing it in, I guess one is touched on briefly is to how to uh, know about harmonic issues, what harmonic issues they have on site. As I say, there may already be some sort of energy, smart energy metering on the site that will actually tell you what the harmonics are. Uh, otherwise, carry out a power quality um, study. Okay. So, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank um, everyone for taking the time to attend our presentation today. Um, I know we've got another question here. Uh, what do you think? How do you calculate the size of the unit? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, ABB have actually got some um, sizing software, PQF sizing software. So we've got a copy of that. So if you, um, we can help you size up a harmonic filter. Basically, if you can give us information about the what the loads, what the loads on the on the, of the application are, what the harmonic uh, levels are, and what you're looking, the limit you're trying to meet then we can size up a, an appropriate harmonic filter. Uh, a, a single line diagram, if you haven't done actual power quality study, a single line diagram is a good, good starting point. We can do some uh, estimated uh, calculations of that. But obviously the most accurate is a power quality study is done and you've got the measured values. So either of those, if you feed that information to us, we can size the, the filter for you. Okay, so this is a good question whether we can um, distribute the slides for everyone to use for future reference. I don't that, know if you're an issue or not. That. No, that, that's not a, not a problem. There's nothing confidential. You're welcome to distribute as you see fit. If there's any, uh, any question that we haven't really answered, you can always send us an email as well or giving us a call. Um, 
Well, let's have another question here, Pete. Uh, can the unit be used in conjunction with the PFC? Uh, yes, the short answer is it, it, it can can be used. Uh, we had a application of mine site in, in New South Wales where we had both ABB power factor correction and the uh, harmonic filters being, being used together. There are certain requirements in regards to the location of the the electrical location of the CTs of the two units. Um, so, and if you have an application where you need both, let us know and we can, we can go through that with you in more detail. But the short, short answer is yes, the two can be used together. Okay, guys, are there any more questions? Yes, for the uh, training to get certified by ABB, what is the length of the class and what is the cost? Uh, okay, so ABB actually, um, they run a two-day two training course last uh, October. Uh, they run that at Lilydale, and from memory, the cost is four hundred and fifty dollars per person. Uh, a two two day course on the harmonic filters, and I believe they've got one coming up in September. Um, I, I can we can check the exact date and come back to you. So there will be another one, in, a two day one in September at Lilydale. We'll, we'll email you the date, uh, Jim. That'd be fantastic. We're going to have a couple teams come down. So oh, brilliant. Yep, looking good. Looking forward to it. Excellent. Good, good to hear. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, for organising all this. Um, but yeah, if there's no more questions, we might just wrap it up. Uh, just once again, thanks to everyone for uh, making the time to come out uh, and listen to us today. Um, any other questions, please give us a call or, or send us an email. We'll, we'll be happy to assist you. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate your time. Likewise. Thank, thank you for attending. Yep. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.